Well, hello uh, everyone. Welcome to Grow Topsoils, the webinar series that uh, AgriProve is is running. Uh, welcome to this is the third webinar in a seven part series. Uh, uh, and I'd first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land where we're meeting from wherever around Australia and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Matthew Warnkin. I'm the managing director of uh, AgriProve. Uh, AgriProve is a soil carbon project developer with a prime focus on enabling landholders to participate in carbon markets and emerging environmental markets, enabling farmers to access additional revenues. And we're really pleased to be hosting this seven part webinar series uh, with Declan McDonald, who's principal soil scientist with Regen Soils to really uh, look at how we unpack that journey on how to improve soil health and how to grow soil carbon. Uh, Declan, professional soil scientist, more than 30 years experience in soil and agriculture. If you had the fortune of uh, tuning into the, the past two uh, webinars, uh, the first one being on how soil works and how plants grow, uh, the second on organic matter, the cornerstone of soil health and sustainable production. You know just how fortunate we are to have Declan unlock a lot of those concepts and put it in, in really relatable uh, terms. And, and certainly for me, last uh, the last webinar session, just in terms of conceptualizing soil as that three-legged stool, the, the physical, the biological components, the chemical components, but front and center, soil organic matters being you know, critical to nutrient holding uh, capacity of the, of the soil. Uh, and then the, the key sort of takeaways that stood in my mind from last, uh, the last webinar uh, was related to that nutrient holding potential soil and just that cationic exchange capacity, sand being around nine, uh, clay being around 25, but soil organic matter being 300 to 400, having a cationic exchange capacity of 300 to 400 as just so uh, essential to that nutrient um, transferability to, to plants. Uh, and then that other a key a takeaway for me was that nearly two thirds of the soil organic carbon pool, so two thirds of soil organic carbon is made up of soil microbial detritus. Um, so they're the dead bodies of, of microbes. And the other fun word I, I learned during the week was uh, necromass as another way of talking about that. So really just um, highlighting just the fundamental importance of that microbial act activity to building soil organic carbon. And as always, not having these discussions in that abstract concept, but really trying to bring it fundamentally back down to those pr uh, land production systems. Uh, so that how do we build soil health? How do we build soil organic carbon? Um, with a commercial focus on reducing costs, increasing profits, and uh, ultimately reducing overall uh, risks. Um, this third webinar is on soil biology, millions of years in the making. Uh, before I throw to Declan, uh, as always, just some housekeeping for this webinar. Uh, we are recording the, the, the webinars. They will be available on our website if for whatever reason you uh, drop out or can't, can't access it. So if you miss a session, they will be available. Uh, we're gonna run this session for around about 40 odd uh, minutes uh, uh, with, with Declan's uh, presentation and leaves questions at, at, at the end, uh, time for questions. And um, the uh, session is also being streamed on YouTube Live. There is a chat pane on YouTube Live for questions and comments. If you're on uh, through Zoom, please use the, the Q&A uh, button for questions and, and you're, also, um, uh, you're also free to make the use the comment function throughout uh, the uh, webinar. Uh, you can send a message to everyone or just the host and, and um, panelists. Um, so uh, Declan, we're up to uh, three, uh, webinar three of seven. So without any further ado, we'll get you to um, uh, come off mute and start your video and then start that uh, that uh, presentation and really looking forward to this week's installment on how to grow top soils. Thanks Declan. Thanks Matthew. Uh, I need the host to allow me to screen share. Uh -huh. So that's a really good technical question. Now hopefully we have got a host. <laughs> 
and um, that has happened. Otherwise, we're going to be having to do it all by uh, mime and improvisation, which can get a bit tidy on. Um, I'm actually not the host. Uh, so it's probably Melanie or Stephen is hosting, so they just need to allow me to, to screen share. Uh, yeah, so I'm just waiting for that. But just to um, reiterate what Matthew was saying, I... Um, uh, this series is, is trying to, to build a picture starting from um, a point of kind of no assumed prior knowledge about how soil works and how plants grow. Uh, and we're stepping through the story of organic matter, which we did last week. We're going to talk about soil biology this week. And as I said, it's difficult to talk about these things in isolation because there's such overlap. We're talking about systems here. Uh, so um, th there is a, a necessary overlap um, between the, these different subject areas, but the focus today certainly is um, on soil biology. Next week, we're going to talk about minerals, uh, and that's uh, principally about the role of macro and micro nutrients. The following week, we'll talk about managing that fertility to build soil carbon. So this is where we, we're beginning to link these concepts together. Uh, the following week, we'll talk about management practices that complement that. And then finally, we'll talk about bringing it all together, which is around monitoring and evaluation um, and uh, um, uh, uh, figuring out, uh, out how to know that we're making progress. OK, um, I've got access to screen sharing. So that is the second. And hopefully, we're, I'm, I'm on the right uh, screen, Matthew. Okay, so the, um, the core principle, I think, that, um, that, that we really need to take on board, and this, to me, this is stating the bleeding obvious, but I, I think we still haven't gotten it, and that is that all life depends on the soil, and there can be no life without soil, and no soil without life. They have evolved together, and this is a quote from a famous naturalist from back in 1938. So, um, the... the um, the United Nations has taken a, a really strong interest in soil biodiversity in recent years, and they're trying to uh, really raise awareness of the critical importance of soil biodiversity, not only from the point of view of, of, of you know, general biodiversity and ecosystem function, but really as an underpinning element in, in, in uh, sustainable landscapes. And I'll leave you to read those, um, those quotes. Uh, so in uh, 2001, uh, there was a, a convention on, on biological diversity and, and, and uh, soil biodiversity came out of that. A global soil biodiversity atlas was uh, published in 2016 and focused very strongly on the roles of soil organisms, uh, which we will talk about further going through this presentation. Um, this is a slide, a few of the slides that I'm using today come from my time with the Victorian government and uh, there was a large program that I was part of which was a soil health initiative and, and uh, at the time we produced some really great uh, uh, resources around soil health and around soil uh, biology as well and uh, some of these slides are from there and what this is showing is that in, in very simple terms we can, we can break up the components of the soil biological population into microflora, microfauna, mesofauna. And this is a division by size principally. And uh, over on the right, you can see, you know, 10 times magnification right down to more than hundred times magnification to see things like bacteria, archaea, uh, funguses and the like, uh, slightly larger. And, and, and this represents levels of the, of the food chain as well, where we have a lot of protozoa and nematodes feeding on the, on the uh, bacteria and fungal the, the, the um, uh, microflora layer. Uh, Calimbala and mites, their principal um, uh, functions, as you can see here, are you know, as, as shredders and driving nutrient cycles. And then we have what, what we refer to as the soil engineers up the top end, the earthworms, beetles, ants, and termites that are physically moving soil around and, uh, and, and you know, substantially re-engineering the macro environment. 
Um, what's really important as well, and what we tend not to pay so much attention to, are the the invertebrates, which which kind of occupy uh, the, the space between the the um, the microorganisms and the and the and the macroorganisms. And these this relates to uh, to the mites. Um, in particular, which make up a really huge proportion of the invertebrate population and uh, assorted um, uh, uh, life stages of other, uh, of other insects and arthropods. Um, these, again, these all have a really significant role in nutrient cycling because of their, if you like, pre-processing of materials before uh, fungi and bacteria um, get stuck into them. Now we'll talk about why soil biology is important. So, you know, the first and foremost thing is it, it decomposes plant residues. And, um, you know, this is a bit like, I don't know if you all remember the stories of, I think it was Naples in, in Italy when, you know, the mafia who controlled the rubbish collection decided they weren't going to pick up any refuse anymore. And suddenly the city was uh, just buried in its own garbage. And uh, of course it was a disaster zone. Well, so it would be for the planet if uh, we didn't have all these workers busily breaking down our organic matter and keeping it cycling. And you'll recall last week when we talked about organic matter, you know, almost the most important thing that has to happen with organic matter is it's got to move, it's got to cycle and it's got to keep moving. And it's that cycling that releases nutrients, makes nutrients available and, and, and sustains life by keeping uh, energy systems flowing through the soil and above the soil. Soil biology is critically associated with soil structure and we talked a bit about that last week and we'll talk about that in future weeks too in terms of really what these guys are doing is they're, they're trying to rearrange their home and, um, and uh, uh, oftentimes we're working against that with our management practices. Um, soil biology is, is regulating plant nutrient supply and that's very much through that um, organic matter cycling that I talked about. Uh, soil biology strongly influences the manifestation of pest and disease pressure and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through as well. Major role in, 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 in uh, degrading pesticides and herbicides and other uh, toxic compounds in the soil. Uh, I always think it's amazing that um, we have this appreciation of you know clear running mountain streams and the like and and without fully realizing that it's the soil and everything that's living in the soil really that is doing the cleaning for us and, and keeping a little bit like the decomposing function, it's keeping our environment clean um, and providing ecosystem services to us for that very reason, regulating water quality, as I just mentioned, and mediating greenhouse gas capture and release uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and we could say a lot more about that. So uh, what regulates soil biology? So, um, and, and these are some of the resources out of the Victorian Soil Health uh, Initiative. Um, there's primary regulators and secondary regulators. And the primary regulators primarily relate to climate and geochemistry. So soil water temperature, soil type, and that's soil texture that we talked a bit about last week and soil pH. And the secondary regulators relate to organic matter quality and quantity. Uh, management practices, principally things like disturbance and inputs, what we're, what we're putting into the soil. So we'll step through some of these regulators. So we have an understanding of what impacts soil biology and by understanding what impacts soil biology, that is, is going to provide us with information about the management practices that we employ and whether they're supportive of increased soil biological population and improved soil function or whether it's going to have a, a negative impact on, on soil function. So as an example, uh, earthworm abundance, and, and this is some work that uh, I think uh, Pauline Mealy did, who was the, uh, possibly still is the principal microbiologist with the Victorian government, looking at worm populations and saw a, a really strong correlation between rainfall and uh, worm populations. Traditionally, we use 600 millimeters as the kind of threshold below which worm populations really drop. But I've seen well-managed farms in lower rainfall areas that still have reasonably healthy worm populations. But certainly as we move into the drier landscapes, 
uh, termites and ants take over the role of um, of earthworms in terms of that uh, that um, uh, you know soil engineering function. What's really important to understand is that um, you know when we talk about soil biology, millions of years in the making, and I, I, I made this point in the first uh, presentation that these uh, everything that lives in the soil has got really sophisticated adaptive strategies to changing climatic conditions. And certainly amongst the bacteria and the fungi, they're very responsive to changes in conditions. So they produce resting bodies in the form of spores to, uh, which, are, which tend to have high levels of protection against uh, environmental pressures, which make them very effective resting uh, bodies, which can survive really long times of adverse conditions uh, in the soil uh, and um, maintain the, the, I guess, the DNA uh, so that when conditions change, the organism is triggered to grow again and can, can flourish when conditions are, um, are suited. Uh, we talked about land use, and I think I shared this graph before, and, and the, the, um, the land uses in question here are listed on the right-hand side because it's difficult uh, to read along the x-axis. Uh, but what this is showing is you know, land use and tillage in particular here we're seeing as a key regulator. So where we have perennial grassland systems on the left, we have high uh, arthropod populations in this particular study, and where we have high levels of disturbance, particularly around uh, potatoes. Pyrethrum was a little bit of an outlier here, but that's uh, got more to do with the fact that um, the understory of pyrethrum uh, cultivation is kept bare uh, with herbicide use, and also the um, um, uh, exudates from pyrethrum uh, uh, may not be so conducive to healthy uh, or to high soil biological populations in monocultures. Uh, we talked a bit about last week about uh, the importance of soil organic matter as the, as the primary energy source in soil. So where we have uh, um, uh, high organic matter, we have the, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have high microbial populations, but it is a precursor to high microbial populations. And we certainly saw that in the Tasmanian study where we had particularly high levels of soil organic matter, we had high proportions of soil arthropods. Um, there's always a lot of interest in, in, in the impact of chemicals on soil microbiological populations. And there's no definitive answer really on this because we have so many different types of chemicals. Some papers report increases in soil uh, uh, um, uh, uh, microbial biomass in response to a particular chemical being applied. Uh, and others show a deleterious effect. I think where we see a positive response in, from the, the soil microbiological community, it's where they're able to access the particular chemical as a food resource, and so the, the population expands as a result. But this work by Gupta from South Australia, uh, um, I, I think is probably more representative if we are to generalize about chemical impacts on soil microbiological populations to show that the soil generally has a strong capacity to recover. And, and this relates back to when I was talking about the resting spores of soil microbiology. When, uh, when, when there's a toxic event and, 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 um, and organisms start getting killed off, uh, many will be triggered into to the formation of resting spores to survive the, 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 uh, the event. And then as conditions improve or the toxic compounds get um, uh, decomposed by more tolerant uh, or, or uh, elements of the, of the microbial community, they're able to access these compounds as a food resource and conditions improve, we see uh, populations rebounding. Uh, and depending on the chemical used, we have degrees of reversibility. Some chemicals, and you can put, you know, the organophosphates, for example, or PFAS, not that they're herbicides, and not that PFAS is a herbicide, into this category, but we have uh, compounds that are so toxic that the effect is irreversible. I think the really important point that Gupta was showing in this work is what happens when there's repeat applications. We impact on the system's capacity to rebound. 
and it is slower to recover. And although it's not shown here, we can clearly see that if there's another application here, the system is going to, the capacity of, this, of the system to rebound is going to be further impacted. And the example that I always use is when you go into your local park and there's a routine application of Roundup or some other herbicide on the edge of the path to stop the grass growing onto the path, we end up with a dead zone there. And there's usually one or two species that are able to, to survive there and they proliferate as weeds. And of course, then the council has to come along and spray them again. But we end up with a, a semi-dead zone as the capacity of the system to recover, uh, as in to degrade the toxic chemical becomes overwhelmed by the volume of chemical that, um, that, that becomes a, you know, that, that remains as residue in the soil. Um, her, uh, some herbicides, when we talk about herbicides, I'm uh, of necessity being very generic here because there's lots of different kinds of herbicides and, and with, with varying effects. But uh, what this study looked at was the impact of, of herbicide use on nitrogen fixing bacteria and on the impact of, uh, of um, herbicides on nodulation of legumes. And um, where we have uh, uh, no herbicide, we've got effective nodulation on this route here. And with herbicide, we have that uh, impact where nod nodules don't form and uh, um, nitrogen fixation does not occur. Um, this work uh, was also done by, by Pauline Mealy, and she looked at the impact of Lyme application and the influence of Lyme on uh, soil biology. And Lyme is, 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 is a really widely used impact to alleviate soil acidity and, um, and, and, and specifically the uh, pressure from aluminium in soils at very low pHs. But this study showed that there was an increase in um, the activity of um, ammonium oxidizers in soil. And what this infers is an improvement in the nitrogen cycle, in the function of the nitrogen cycle, where we have uh, an increase in ammonium oxidizers, which are a critical element in the nitrogen cycle. And of course, most importantly, biology regulates biology. Um, and we have this, this, uh, this, this principle called the Elton Principle, uh, which holds that the greater the complexity of a microbiological community, in terms of number and diversity of organisms, the greater the stability. Now, this is a general principle of biodiversity. And we understand that the more biodiverse communities are, whether they're in the soil or above ground, the more stable uh, and functioning that they're going to be. We know that diverse swords support diverse biological communities. And that diversity uh, supports increased resistance to pest and disease um, pressure. Um, and this in turn provides increased resilience to agricultural soils. And I've got a few more examples of that as we go through. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about soil biodiversity and, and focusing on, on the importance of, um, of, of promoting biodiversity as in uh, um, you know, multiples of species in the soil. And, uh, and multiples of, um, of species in the, in the sward and what we're growing and what we're putting into the soil to try and promote that, that uh, diversity below ground. So when we talk about soil health, we're talking about the ecological attributes of the soil. And this is a, you know, part of the, I, I, what I would describe as our new learning about soil is that soil biodiversity may not be a soil property that's critical for the production of a given crop. And this is where, I guess conventional agriculture has been able to ignore soil biodiversity to a degree because by putting on lots of our really, you know, powerful and effective fertilizers, we've been able to grow the crop. But it hasn't, it, it, this is beginning to explain why we're seeing soil um, 
uh, soil quality deterioration or failing responses to the same level of fertilizer because soil biodiversity is a property that may be vital for the continued capacity of the soil to support that crop because of all the work that soil biodiversity does in maintaining soil function, in, in, in using that fertilizer that's, uh, that's applied and working with plants to support uh, you know, plant health and, and uh, root function. Um, there was a very large review done in, uh, across a number of con con continents that compared organic and conventional agriculture and found that organic farming increases biodiversity at every level of the food chain. And the majority of those studies found that organic farming benefited wildlife. A few showed that there was some detrimental effect and there was uh, 25 that produced mixed results or suggested no difference. Uh, when we're looking at managing biodiversity for, for carbon and for nitrogen, um, this Dutch study studied um, uh, eight plants, four grasses and uh, four uh, forbs. And the, um, uh, the, I'll just bring up these small graphs here, which essentially are showing the top line here are soil carbon stocks, so uh, nitrogen stocks and, um, and root biomass. And we can see that there's an increase here with plant species uh, richness across all of these measures here, above ground biomass, uh, organic carbon decomposition and uh, potential net nitrogen mineralization. So the same study showed that diversity had a, a positive impact on microbial biomass and activity, and that increases in, co in carbon came from new carbon, carbon inputs from root exudates. And I think we touched briefly on that last week, talking about this liquid carbon pathway, as some people refer to it as, which is the amount of carbohydrate coming into the system from root exudates. Um, these effects were highest under high plant biodiversity and uh, diversity. And as we talked about last week, microbial necromass, that um, microbial uh, detritus, ends up in the human in the humus pool. And uh, this particular study showed that uh, um, soil organic matter with markers of microbe derived products constituted 34% of uh, soil organic matter. Uh, whereas the study that I cited last week was close to, to double that contribution. Uh, just a brief word about soil exudates and, and soil organic carbon um, sequestration. What, what this, is, what this uh, study showed, uh, what this study uh, contrasted rather, was the difference between uh, living roots and, um, and plant tops going into the soil. Uh, living roots only where the plant tops were removed and the third treatment where uh, litter only both root and shoot was applied and what the uh, study showed was that there was a significantly um, greater quantity and we're talking about between 2 and 13 times a greater efficiency um, of carbon sequestration where we had living roots year round rather than where uh, the organic matter was applied uh, to, the, uh, to the soil directly. Um, and this uh, has got a lot to do with the, um, with the, if you like, this liquid carbon pathway that I mentioned, uh, whereby um, these labile carbon and dissolved organic carbon compounds are efficiently microbially uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, complexed, turned over and deposited into the mineral associated uh, soil organic carbon pools. Oh, I had that there. Uh, an example of uh, the influence of living roots year round comes from um, Col Sice, who's a grazier up in, in, in New South Wales. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Col or heard him speak. Um, and he, he's the joint developer of, uh, of pasture cropping. And one of the great things I think that Cole was able to demonstrate was substantial changes in his soil quality to depth 
from having living roots year round. And because he's employing pasture cropping, he's got a summer dominant pasture species and he's growing annual cereals in that system. So he's maintaining living roots 12 months of the year. And the differences that have accrued to his soil compared to his brother who lives immediately over the, whose, whose farm is immediately over the fence and who hasn't employed these innovative practices is, um, is really a, a sharp a contrast. And uh, quite a bit of work has been done uh, investigating this on Cole's property and um, has demonstrated uh, a range of improvements in soil properties, not least of which is uh, increase in soil organic matter over time. Um, this piece of work also interestingly shows the importance of um, a diversity uh, of plants and soil microbes to unlock some of the, um, you, you, you'll recall last week we talked about uh, humus as a really important pool for, um, uh, as a, as a, as a um, bank of nutrients to the, the, the drives uh, production in, in, um, in, in um, uh, ecological systems and also that can be captured to drive production in agricultural systems as well. And it essentially shows two pathways. One is the release of organic acids by the plant and these directly um, uh, destabilize the um, uh, bonds that uh, complex organic matter to the mineral fraction of the soil and release that organic matter for microbial degradation and release of nutrients. And then we have the release of soluble carbohydrates by the plant that are stimulating soil microbiological activity so that they can access uh, and break some of those bonds so they can drive that carbon cycle from the humus pool also. So these are the kind of benefits that we get where we have higher levels of diversity in our soil, higher levels of uh, root, uh, uh, higher diversity of root architecture, and as a consequence, higher diversity in our microbial populations. Uh, many of you might remember the kind of manufacturing craze from the, I guess it was the, the 80s, the Japanese just-in-time concept where you didn't stockpile large uh, uh, banks of, um, of inventory uh, because that was a, a cost to the system. Rather, you uh, accessed your uh, required inputs in a just-in-time basis so they would arrive when you need them rather than before. And nature has always operated in a just-in-time system uh, where through communication between plant roots and the microbial um, mutualisms in the soil, nutrients and water, etc., are made available as the plant needs it, not in advance. Now, this uh, graph here, and I think I mentioned this before, just but just as a reminder, uh, it tells us still how little we know about these microbial populations in the soil and how I think as a result, we, we need to treat them with a lot more respect and knowing that these organisms have evolved over millions of years and perform really important functions in the soil and yet our knowledge of them remains, uh, you know, very low. Um, uh, developing, but, but low. So this, uh, this kind of summarizes what I've been talking about here. This is our, our you know, the, the, the uh, uh, in essence, the, the cycling of nutrient where you recall in week one, we talked about the capture of uh, energy from the sun, the manufacture of the, the original primary producer of food sources that being fed into the soil to feed uh, the mutualism that exists in the soil, the functioning of the soil and the, the um, uh, the, the benefits then that, of course, accrue to us as, as growers. Now, when we're talking about managing soil biodiversity, you, you know, why restoration takes time. This was a, an interesting study on, on grasslands formerly used as agricultural uh, fields. And the, um, the study reported that the, all the, the known groups of soil organisms were present from the start uh, in this system, but something was missing. And what appeared to be missing and what was found to be missing was the links 
between them, the communication between them was missing. And so the authors talked about the groups not socializing and because they weren't socializing, the community wasn't ready to support a diverse plant community. And this is further evidence for you know, people that say, I'm gonna go organic and drop everything and the system crashes. Why, if we're going to transition through to a regenerative model, we need to, we need to take it a considered approach and a strategic approach and step through this and no kind of two sudden movements, but using what we're, uh, what we're um, following the principles that we're covering in this, in this uh, series of webinars, we're going to step through a process in a considered way. It doesn't have to be too slow, but in a considered way that's going to allow the system to move with us. And what this study showed is when nature restoration uh, progresses um, and these links are made, uh, function is, is restored. And one of the things that came out of this uh, uh, study was again the, 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 the central role of soil fungi as drivers of this interconnectedness in the system uh, and, how, and, and the role that fungi play in the development of new networks in the soil. Um, so, as I said before, you know, when we our, our understanding of soil biodiversity principally came from, you know, the very very limited information we got from petri dishes, and now we're inundated with information. And our our key researchers are working now uh, to unlock all of this information to try and, uh, you know, lift the lid on on uh, our understanding of of what is in the soil and how it's working. Now, briefly, I'll just mention that. Uh, you know the the ubiquity of of uh, of soil microorganisms of microorganisms that 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 we need to be aware of in in agriculture is more than just in the soil. You know, there's biology in the seed. There's organisms that live on the leaf. There's organisms that live on and in the roots, inside plant parts, as well as in the soil. When we talk about managing these, uh, you know, the biology of the seed. Uh, can be, although we might not fully understand uh, how all of that works, um, we can uh, enhance that and certainly a lot of grower experience is showing that pre-treatment of seed can enhance the germination and the early vigour in those seeds. And, and there's trials with various um, inputs uh, underway. Uh, currently in Beng Warden, I'm doing some work looking at the use of uh, nutrisoil and uh, digestate on early uh, on germination and early emergence. Uh, I mentioned this guy Johnson Sue. This is a, a method to enhance uh, fungal populations on on seedlings and the role that there um, that that uh, that has on early emergence and vigor as well. Um, I'm involved in similar trials up in Lake Boga, looking at uh, nutrisoil compost extracts and blends of the same. And then uh, things like trace elements and um, and uh, other microbial treatments, which we need we need to evaluate on a case by case uh, basis. So um, when we're talking about managing soil biodiversity, we talked about soil organic matter as a primary energy source. We talked about the importance of diversity, uh, the uniqueness of each crop in terms of its root architecture and the residues that it, um, it, uh, it contributes to the soil. So practices that are going to encourage that are increasing diversity, so multi-species, intercropping if we can in our otherwise monocrops. Can we, uh, can we have a, uh, say, a, a non-competing legume sitting underneath a cereal crop that's going to uh, benefit soil and and cash crop alike. Uh, can we look at our tillage practices? Uh, improving living conditions means enhancing soil structure, and we'll talk about that going forward. Covering the soil is such a critical principle in all of this work, and we'll talk about that going forward in the next coming weeks as well, uh, and uh, as well as looking at the impacts of compaction and drainage. So if we are going to uh, try and enhance early seedling emergence and vigor, you know, how we treat seed is with generally fairly low application rates um, per ton of seed. Uh, and we can do that using, you know, uh, auger systems, or we can do it a little bit more primitively using um, something like a, a cement mixer. 
Uh, this is uh, David Johnson, and he's from, uh, I'm not sure if it was Texas, one of the Southern American universities. And he's essentially got this static compost pile, which is made up, uh, you know, normally when we make compost, we look for a starting carbon to nitrogen ratio in the order of about 30 to one. Uh, he's probably starting off with here with more than 100 to one. It's essentially a, a highly carbon based um, uh, mix. And because it's a highly carbon based mix, it really requires fungi to break it down. And this is a very slow, uh, long term process. But his um, uh, product at the end is a highly fungal dominated compost. And he's uh, been doing some really fascinating work, uh, which has shown amazing responses to uh, not only early seedling emergence and vigor, but to overall crop productivity from enhancing fungal populations in the soil. Um, again, work that we can do about enhancing foliar and soil biodiversity. We can look at, at, uh, at uh, um, foliar sprays uh, and other treatments. And as I said, we, we need to treat these things as cautions. You know, with, with compost teas and the like, I've seen, uh, you know, quite impressive results and I've seen nothing happen at all. So what we're trying to do is, uh, is, is uh, I guess, see if there's an available ecological niche that requires filling in our soil. And if we're filling that with a compost tea, we'll see a really good response. If, if there's no available niche or the organisms that are already there in the soil are, are already doing you know, an excellent job, they'll consume what we apply for, for dinner and we'll see no uh, result. But these are just some examples of application rates of some of these uh, commonly used inputs that you can trial on your own land. Uh, this is just very quickly, this is an example of a couple of innovative growers from Canada growing in really kind of brutal and uh, inhospitable conditions, you know, short growing season. Uh, and they're paying particular attention to their trace elements, as well as some stimulants that are going to help promote uh, biological activity um, at, um, at sowing. So there's lots of different ways that we can cut this and we're limited only by um, uh, our, our willingness to try new things. There's lots of good information coming out now, not only in the uh, scientific literature, but in the popular literature as well. But I, I caution you a bit with what's coming out in the popular literature. Uh, a lot of that is uh, just pop. Um, so, in, in summary, um, this is where we're up to, week three here, and hopefully we're slowly building this picture on how you can apply some of these practices on your own land. Okay, Matthew, back to you, and um, time for some questions. Great. Look, thank you so much, Declan. Um, as usual, just a, a great a range of, of material uh, covered, just capturing that complexity of uh, soil biology. Uh, and this uh, webinar, I particularly liked uh, the linkages you got in, uh, especially those of the Italian mafia, uh, the, uh, the 80s production system of just in time, obviously not to be confused with the uh, song from this, the same era of uh, Ride on Time. That could be top of your playlist, uh, no doubt. Um, also shout out to Carl Zeiss, who is also in Damon Gamow's film, 2040, which has got a great uh, section on uh, soil carbon. I encourage anyone watching who hasn't seen that, that film, 2040, as well worth uh, watching. Uh, a lot of material, uh, obviously, to un unpack. The slides uh, will be made available, as well as uh, this uh, recording of the, the uh, webinar. Um, but then just going through, looking at that, uh, that you know, discussion on soil biology, uh, and the importance of, you know, that, that biology, the, the classes of biology, microflora, microfauna, mesofauna, macrofauna, and the functions that, uh, uh, in terms of their cycling of organic matter, uh, uh, Declan, did strike me, especially what you were talking about, you know, the, the fundamental aspect of, of soils, and, and, and we do often, you know, I guess, gloss over that, but it is fundamental to, to pretty much uh, everything. Soil structure, nutrient nutrient supply, pest and disease uh, pressure. Uh, the one that stood out to me was water quality. And, and you know, when you're talking about those those sort of clear, pristine streams, you know, it's actually the soil and the, and the microbial uh, activity of the soil biology that's actually delivering those uh, crystal clear streams that 
you know, then again, that great concept of, you know, biology regulating um, biology, um, importance of year-round living roots and, and you know, uh, going on and on again. Maybe just to kick off, um, we talked a lot about this week, the need for diversity, and obviously multi-species has been a key, key part in that. I think one of your slides, uh, Declan, you was, was, you, uh, was it pointing to the fact that there was a, a beneficial result in nitrogen, basically from that biological diversity, even though there was no legumes planting? Or did I, did I misread that slide? No, what that relates to is nitrogen mineralization in the, in the soil. Um, uh, and what we were talking about with plant diversity and uh, soil microbiological diversity is you know, having enough specialists in the soil that are able to unlock the nitrogen that exists in the bank of soil organic matter, which we talked a lot about last week. Organic matter is the, you know, it's the central bank uh, of the of the soil's economy, and it's where the, the the reserves of gold are held, and that needs to trickle out at the same time as as trickle in to feed the system. So it's what's keeping, it's what's maintaining stability in the system. It's what's maintaining essential flow of nutrients, and nitrogen is but one of those. Let me just flowing on from that. Are you aware of any any studies, Declan, that that pick up? A greater level of nutrient density or nutrient quality in food uh, that's coming from systems with high biological activity, high soil microbial populations? Look, I'm, I'm aware of a, a, a number of studies that have looked at this and the, uh, I'm not sure that I've seen any that are kind of completely definitive about this. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether, you know, about this kind of current common phrase of nutrient density and I'm, 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 I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, but I, 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 I would, um, I certainly would expect that um, the availability of all essential macro and micro elements is going to be uh, enhanced uh, in a system where all of the working parts are, are, are there and functioning. So where, when soil function is high, when nutrient cycling is high, and when all the inputs to the system are um, are feeding the, that that machinery are feeding that function, and uh, I think in uh, where we have really strong associations then between plants and the soil microbiological community that is um, uh, you know built up around ensuring the supply of those essential elements. You know, I'm not sure if I, I talked last week, but. There's, there's a remarkable intelligence in the soil where plants are able to signal to the soil microbiological community exactly what their needs are. And uh, uh, when plants are able to signal into a soil that's highly functioning, then there's going to be workers there to deliver that to the soil. But in a soil that's a monoculture where there's a limited root exploration because of the monoculture of uh, the, the, the mono dimensionality of roots in that system, all of those functions may not be working as well as in a more diverse system. Uh, uh, Declan, the other thing, uh, issue you brought up uh, in today's session uh, in terms of impacts on uh, soil biology was the use of uh, herbicides um, and you know, how that can affect biological communities. How do you, from a practical perspective, how would you go about, how would a farmer go about telling what herbicides are reversible versus what herbicides would, would fit in that irreversible category? I, I really don't know that I can answer that question, Matthew. I, I don't know if you saw the kerfuffle during the week about herbicide residues here in Victoria that I found myself in the, in the, in the centre of. But, uh, you, you know, in, in that particular case, we were looking just at one family of herbicides, which are the phenoxy acid herbicides. And there's probably, you know, 30 odd different active ingredients, different compounds in that one family alone. And the research that I did showed that the, the half life of, uh, of those compounds varies quite a bit. So that means even in that one family of herbicides that are some that are much more degradable than others and others that will have a more toxic and longer term effect on, on soil biology. So uh, I, 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 I don't know if anybody has, has teased that one apart. It's, uh, it's such, a, such a, a big question.
Sure. Well, so maybe maybe looking at it from a, a, another way, is, do you have any thoughts in terms of the quickest way to restart populations that may have been in decline from, from herbicide use, like you know, uh, probiotics or biological stimulants or anything like that? Do you have any thoughts as to how you could restart or improve those sort of biological counts? Yeah, I think that's a much better way to look at it, uh, Matthew, because, you know, the, the reality is in, in, in modern farming, you know, in, in so many situations, we have to use herbicides. So if we have to use herbicides, how can we use them most strategically and in a way that really minimizes the impact on soil, micro, on soil biology full stop? And there's a few things that growers can do. Uh, many uh, herbicides uh, work, uh, you know, have higher efficacy at lower pHs. So there's a common trend now to lower the pH of tank mixes to about four and a half to, uh, and by increasing the efficacy in that way, we can use 70 to 50% less of the active ingredient. So we're putting less into the soil. Uh, the other thing that, um, and I haven't seen much research on this, but this is actively promoted by um, uh, regenerative growers is to combine a carbon source with the, uh, uh, with the tank mix and, and, and the carbon source uh, most uh, popularly recommended is fulvic acid uh, because it uh, functions not only as a, as a carbon source to provide essentially organic matter to help the affected soil microbial community to bounce back from the toxic shock, if you like, of the, of the herbicide being applied. Uh, but it also acts as a chelator, which helps to increase the uh, efficiency of plant uptake. So if we're using less active ingredient, we're getting it into the plant quicker, we're increasing the effectiveness of it in the plant, there's, there's less collateral damage, if you like, of uh, you know, spray being missing its target and ending up in the soil. Cool. And maybe just then following on, and I think what you're referring to was some of the uh, issues around the compost and compost quality. Uh, that was also was in the in the press, but as a as a general rule, with in terms of compost, there's a question in terms of uh, do you have any thoughts on the regulation of the compost industry? How do farmers go about ensuring a good quality uh, uh, you know, compost um, uh, in terms of having confidence in, in that uh, product that they can apply to, to land? Look, one one of the one of the kind of the, probably the supreme irony that came out of this this issue of the of the um, the herbicide residues in compost is that uh, you know people are saying to me, well, you know, what can I do? I've got it in my I've got it in my soil now. You know, how can I fix it? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to fix it. There's not some magic spray that we can put on to make the residue go away. The 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 half life of these compounds. Is, is a measure of the capacity of soil microbial communities to degrade the active ingredient. So the irony is that the, the best possible place for these residues to be is in a, is in a healthy uh, um, 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 biodiverse compost, because that is the, 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 the environment that is, is best able to, to break these down uh, if the compound is not so toxic that it will overcome the capacity of the, of the organisms to degrade it. So um, fungi, as we said, seem to have a key role in, in a lot of these functions. So having a mature compost and the longer we let a compost mature, generally the more, the higher the fungal population in that compost is going to be. And it uh, also provides enough time to break down any of those residues. So when it comes to getting that compost, that mature compost out on farm, hopefully, you know, we've done as much as we can to uh, to manage any nasties that might be in there. Uh, speaking of breaking down uh, residues, Declan, uh, would you uh, recommend sort of application of liquids or granulars to further boost microbial activity to say break down mulches that were being applied or break down compost, compost that were being surface applied? Look, there, there is scope to do that. And in fact, only yesterday I was uh, recommending, uh, you know, as a treatment for, for people, say, who have applied this compost into their home gardens, is to apply some dynamic lifter, um, some form of nitrogen, um, and to keep, the, uh, keep the, the soil or the compost moist. So what we're doing here is we're, we're tipping the carbon to nitrogen ratio in favour of 
decomposition. So by providing more nitrogen, we're going to hasten the breakdown of the carbon that's in there. But, and in so doing, we're going to temporarily boost soil microbiological or the microbiological populations in that compost. Uh, where we have high microbiological populations, we're maximizing the likelihood of, uh, of uh, um, a breakdown of some of these residues. So yes, adding some nitrogen into these systems uh, as a temporary measure to hasten the uh, decomposition is, is likely to be helpful. Um, sticking with the applying organic matter to land, do you have any observations on incorporating compost actually into the to the soil level uh, as opposed to just surface spreading? Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we touched on this last week or not, Matthew, but, but incorporation of compost is always a preferable uh, strategy, but um, not, not at the cost of, of tillage. So if you have, um, uh, if you've got a pasture, you, you know, that's been down for 30 years, uh, uh, cultivating that just to get compost in is, is going to do far more harm than good. So in a situation like that, my, my, my recommendation is that the, the pasture is grazed down quite hard, uh, quite short, uh, so that when we apply the compost, we're maximizing compost soil, surface soil contact. And then we want to allow a long rest period to allow that pasture to grow up through the compost and in so doing create that humid microenvironment at the surface of the soil that's going to promote uh, colonization of that compost by surface growing uh, fungi and bacteria and uh, hasten its incorporation into the soil. Great. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour, Declan, so we'll just round out this webinar with a, a couple more questions. Um, and this comes back to uh, another aspect you raised uh, in today's session about seed treatments. Um, so we're interested in your thoughts in terms of seed treatments uh, and, and maybe other biological stimulants to build microbial populations in low rainfall zones, uh, say under 300 mils, and whether or not do you see any prospects in this being a pathway to building soil carbon? Well, well, firstly, uh, you know, seed treatments are not new, uh, uh, and and uh, you know, the, the 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 obvious example there is the treatment of legume seeds with rhizobium bacteria. Uh, so that when we plant those legumes in the soil, the, the, the correct rhizobia are, go into the soil with the, um, with the seed so that those plants then form nodules and, and, and sequester potentially considerable quantities of nitrogen from the atmosphere. What we're talking about now with uh, seed treatments to enhance uh, uh, not only uh, germination and early seedling vigor and ultimately crop yield, is, 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 is a, a progression of thinking around uh, harnessing beneficial microbial uh, influences on, on, on plant uh, development and on plant roots and on early uh, colonization of plant roots and on early uh, establishment of those networks that we talked about in the soil to promote early soil function. Now, what has surprised everybody is some work by um, by uh, a, 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 a cropping family called the Hegarty's over in Western Australia. And they're in, in um, uh, the Northern uh, cropping district on very low rainfall, I think about 400 millimeters uh, and, and pretty poor soil, the kind of super marginal land that, 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 that uh, many farmers have walked away from. And they have embarked on a kind of, well, you know, there's, we've got not a lot to lose. And they have pioneered a lot of seed treatment and the use of things like Nutrisoil uh, on their seed uh, with very low to no input. And again, growing on, you know, the sandy soils and they're getting remarkable results, uh, results that, that are really drawing the attention of a lot of people because uh, the kind of results that I think traditionally we would have said, no, that's, that's just not going to work. Uh, there's too many things against you. Rainfall is too low. Soil quality is so poor, it's not going to work. But it's further lifting the lid on the potential of harnessing uh, soil biology uh, in our cropping systems. And they're, um, they're helping to rewrite the, the rule books. Right. And then just clo closing out then um, in a related theme, but just like how much diversity do we need to access biological benefit and what kind of plant groups are we looking for in, in, in um, you know, plants of this, this sort of diverse species? 
Look, you know, that's a really good question. How much diversity is enough? And I, and I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, you know, if we were to go into, uh, you know, a hectare of, um, of uh, uh, natural, uh, healthy bushland in Australia, you know, we'll probably find that there's hundreds of different species all growing uh, in, that, in that area of land and all contributing different things to that, uh, to that uh, bushland ecosystem, both above and below ground. Um, uh, so I don't know that there is a number, uh, you know, that I can say you have to have this number of species. But when you consider that most of our agricultural systems, you know, for years we've been focusing really on cash crops, on monocrops, on fairly narrow pasture species of two to three uh, uh, primary species. We don't have to do very much to increase diversity by 100% in those systems. And, uh, uh, you know, part of that increased diversity is, is a, 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 an increase in root architecture. And, and, you know, any grower will know that there's a substantial difference between the root system in a, in a clover compared to a ryegrass, compared to a, to a, to a, um, a fodder rape. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, all of these plants are, are, are um, uh, uh, exuding different uh, chemicals with different properties into the soil, um, you know, which are different food systems, which are feeding different elements of the soil. So, you know, if you think about our Amazon jungle, you know, if there's no food for, uh, you know, for the monkeys, if there's no food for uh, the, the sloths and whatever else, they're not going to be there. But if we can reintroduce the food source for those uh, organisms, you know, uh, their populations can be sustained. Great, thanks, thanks, Declan. Um, apologies, we didn't get to everyone's questions. We'll try and pick them up in the next uh, webinar session. Uh, you've been watching How to Grow Top Soils, the Science of Soil Carbon. Uh, this was the webinar on soil biology, millions of years in the, in the making. Thanks to our team, um, shout out to Mel for putting the webinar together. Thank you very much, Declan, once again, from uh, Regen Soils for uh, guiding us through um, uh, this week's webinar. Really looking forward also to next week. Uh, mineral management, uh, the role of macro and micro elements. Uh, and that will be uh, webinar series uh, number four. Uh, any, if any follow-up questions or queries or comments, feel free to, to reach out to us at agriprove at team at agriprove.io. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention and we're looking forward uh, to uh, meeting back at the fourth webinar series uh, on, as we continue this uh, uh, series on how to grow topsoils. Thank you and bye for now. Thank you all.